Good morning. And thank you, everyone. Those were great educational sessions. Uh, our, got our, uh, our minds rolling this morning. I know they were fantastic. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this next session, a very special kind of session. We like to think of how I did it series as sort of SAF's own version of TED Talks. In SAF's version, we look for individuals in our industry who have an interesting story to tell, perhaps about their background, a transformative experience, an innovation, accelerating victories, or painful losses. This morning's stories include all of that and more. Our presenters are talking about beginnings, from the beginning of their foray into the floral industry to the beginning of their slow exit from it. You might not find yourself feverishly taking the notes you did in that last session and in our other programming, but we hope that you will learn a few things in this process nonetheless. So with that, we will begin how I did it, beginnings. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, July 4th, 2008 was a very, very uh, interesting day for me. It was a time when I had a chance to uh, deposit nearly a million dollars into my bank account at the age of 27, which even for a professional poker player is pretty unique. So, just to picture with a scene, I was actually at the World Series of Poker final table and eight people stood in my way of winning a golden bracelet. And beyond that, my mom, my brother, my dad, my friends were there. It's a poker player's dream and everything that we live for. So the question is, how did I get there to this moment? And so I grew up in Westlake Village, California. And at the time, there wasn't much to do there. So after school, myself and my friends, we actually played poker together. And I wasn't even considered one of the best poker players at the time. But what it did is it got my interest going in this game. So I graduated in 1999, and I was fortunate enough to get accepted to UC Berkeley. And as many of you may know, Berkeley is considered a very liberal school. And so Berkeley gives students the opportunity to teach a class if it's passed by the academia. So the first thing I thought about is, I want to teach poker my class didn't get passed. So finally, with one semester left, I go with a big bag of bagels and cream cheese to a math professor, and I convince him, and we call the class the statistics and probability of gaming, and it's passed. And so we didn't have YouTube at the time, so I scoured for every VHS and DVD I could get my hands on, and I started teaching my peers, but the biggest thing to myself is I had to learn the game at the highest level, because if I'm going to teach to some of the smartest students in the country, I have to look credible. So that's when I actually really, truly started to learn the game of poker in a much more advanced way than most people do. So I graduated, and I ended up going to Countrywide. Um, as some of you know, I was uh, responsible for part of the subprime uh, mortgage collapse, and I promise it wasn't me. Um, and Tamar asked me not to say this, but I am. That to this day, that's the only six months that I actually worked for someone else. So at the same time, I had this poker bug, and my boss was my friend. And I go to her and say, hey, do you mind if I play a poker tournament tonight? And she's like, you know what, David? Go ahead. You want to go do it. So by the end of the night, I'd won the poker tournament, my first poker tournament, and I'd won $20,000. So I still live with my parents at the time. I drove back from the casino in downtown LA to Westlake Village, and my mom is sitting there waiting for me. Like, I come from a very conservative Persian Jewish background. I was supposed to be a gastroenterologist like my dad, but it just for some reason wasn't appealing to me the idea of endoscopies and colonoscopies. I don't know. You guys figure it out for yourself. So I come back, and my mom says, David June, in the Persian accent, what is that in your pocket? And so I pulled out the $20,000, and she looked at me, and I feared for the worse. And she just looked at me, she said, David, do you think you can do that again? <laughs> so that was the biggest part, like the biggest thing for me to actually try to play poker professionally. My mom, who's a risk taker, like many of you here, business owners, said just go for it. So in 2006, I started my professional poker career 
And immediately, it, there was a lot of success, again, going from the days at Berkeley when I studied. So I'd won five tournaments in three different continents. And in 2006, I'd won uh, probably more than a million dollars playing poker. But the one thing that escaped me was this World Series of Poker bracelet, because everyone in the community knows you can win, you can win at the casino, but you have to have one of those golden bracelets. And so now back to that moment on June, uh, sorry, July 4th, 2008, I'm sitting there at the final table. My parents flew out to watch me. Uh, as I told you, first place was around $750,000. And the nightmare happened to me that, uh, any, I don't know if anyone here plays poker, but I was dealt two kings and went all in and my opponent had two aces, which is a nightmare. The only fortunate thing is I had more chips than my opponent. So I was still in the tournament, but I was one of the shortest stacks. And we took a break, and my mom came to me again with her David June. Usually David June means, I feel for you, you're in trouble. So she goes, David June, don't worry. I'm actually so proud of the fact that you've been here in your career. But she knew one thing. She really wanted me to win, because if I won the World Series of Poker Bracelet, I knew I could move on to my next challenge in life and still play as a, an amateur, like a good hobbyist. But she also wanted me to move on. I think she wanted me to get married. So, so anyways, uh, I just got in the zone. I continued to chop against my opponents. And finally, heads up, I set a trap for my opponent. And I'd won. And it was amazing to have my family there. So poker was a big part of my life. But on to the next challenge. And one of the things poker did, which is really cool, is it afforded me the opportunity to network with cool people, like athletes, business people. So I became very good friends with Jerry Buss, who's the owner of the Lakers. And he used to invite me and let me sit in his box with him. And so I decided, I said, Jerry, and I called him. I said, do you mind if I come to your house uh, and have lunch with you? I, I want to ask you some questions and get some advice, because I'm looking for the next step. So he came, he ordered food, I sat down. Honestly, I mean, he's passed away, but one of the most generous people I ever met. And he said, what's up, David? What's going on? And I said, Dr. Buss, I've been thinking about this a long time, but I want to become the general manager of the LA Lakers. And at the time, it seemed like a reasonable request, because I was in the clouds, obviously, because of poker. But he was so gracious, he rejected me in the most nice, nice way possible. And he said, you know what you should do, David? You should go to business school. I'll write your letter of recommendation. And I actually ended up, thanks to him, getting accepted to one of the best business schools in the country. I got accepted to the University of Chicago. And one of the things about the university was big on entrepreneurship. And Grubhub, for example, which is a company that connects restaurants to customers around the country, which is one example of a company that grew out of there to a lot of success. At the same time, my friend in LA called me and said, well, his aunt's a local florist, and I have an idea about putting a marketplace where they can showcase their own photos. And our company was born through the university. Uh, and it gave us the opportunity to test our idea with some of the biggest investors. Um, and so we, we entered a competition with 100 business ideas, and we were considered the winner. And so not only did we win and we get proof of concept for this company that we started, but they became our initial investors. So I graduated. We moved back to LA. And then I had to call back on my old friend uh, Poker, because we needed $30,000 to uh, get the first version of the site open. And so Greg, who's my partner, who's very conservative, said to me, David, there is a tournament at Commerce in downtown LA. You should go. So we went. And while I was playing on one table, betting and raising, on the table next to me, they were wireframing and designing out the site, which was a pretty cool moment for us. And so we're at 100 people, and we're there for 15 hours. And we get down to two people. And again, they come, because we need the 30 grand. And my opponent went all in and started celebrating. And my partners were rejected. But what they didn't know is that I'd known I'd actually won the hand. So I showed my hand. Everyone was in confusion. And I walked over to Fabod and said, don't worry. It's flower time. And that's kind of where we started our company. And poker was a huge, poker was a huge part of it. And so before I leave uh, today, I shared a little bit about my, my story. But I want to give you some lessons that I learned in poker that hopefully can apply to you guys and your business. So the first lesson is to leave your emotion at the door. Uh, in poker, there's something called tilt, which means you lose a hand and you're just enraged. And the next hand comes up, and you can't play it the optimal way because you're emotional. Like It's like something coming in and some customer canceling an order, and you just can't take the next order, or your employees see 
that frustration. And so poker's had to lose emotion, especially at the level that we're playing at. And same with the business that we have now. To run a business successfully, you have to isolate one emotion and just leave it there and try the best that you can to just pretend it didn't happen. And poker, people think we're emotionless. That's not true. But we had that ability. The second ability is to read people and to be able to make quick decisions. When I used to play poker, I would actually look at people's pulse. And if the pulse was really going crazy and they showed a bluff, like I knew they did that because they were nervous. Later, if I saw their pulse go crazy and they had the best hand possible, I knew that's because they were excited. So the third hand when they bet and their pulse wasn't going, I could actually take that information within five seconds and say, well, they're not on this side, they're not on this side, they're in the middle. And so I just push all in because I knew that they couldn't call me because they weren't on any extreme that I had to worry about. The same in business. You have to be able to see those things and make quick decisions. And we did this with our investors. We actually raised an extra million dollars in capital because we made a quick call, I remember this, on the phone on PCH where I said, no, we're willing to take this amount of capital. Either you want to work with us or you want to be our friend. And you have to be able to make those calls, whatever you call bluffs, really quickly in decisions. And lastly, execution. Uh, when we started our company, and you guys, uh, I'm sure, have this exact same uh, story, the idea is 5%. Execution is 95%. Most people can come up with an idea. I, I think many people before came up with our idea. Same with in poker, people understand the math. But it's very difficult to be able to calculate stuff, think your opponent's bluffing, and then still push $30,000 in the pot. You have to be able to execute. And that's something that we did at our company as well. And uh, I'd love, if any of you are around, uh, we're at 40 people right now, which is, I'm excited to say, and we're right in the water at Santa Monica. So if you're ever in LA, please look us up. And thank you for your time.